Good morning. Welcome to Trinity. Take out your bulletin. Let's highlight a few announcements. Make one another aware of a few things that's happening around here. If you're a guest, I want to give you a special welcome. Look in the pew rack in front of you. You'll find a card there. I invite you to fill that out. Place it in the offering plate later on in the service. Just give us a record of your attendance. We would appreciate it. A couple of announcements. If you're going on the Perry County Mission Trip, we'll have a meeting right after this service down in the youth room. This won't be a lunch meeting. This will just be an information meeting. Make sure you're aware of all the things that will be happening this week on the trip. Also today, the Prime Timers will be having a lunch at King Buffet. Just show up there at King Buffet. Uh, you should be, if you're involved in both groups, you should be able to uh, meet with the, uh, the uh, group going to Perry County and then drive over to King Buffet. No other activities tonight at church. Wednesday night, the youth will meet here at 2 o'clock and go to Manor House. And then the pickup will be at Insanity Skate Park. Uh, and they'll, then they'll eat at Cheeburger, Cheeburger. I've been instructed how to say that. Cheeburger, Cheeburger. Uh, the uh, announcements are listed there and the, the details are listed there under the youth. Uh, if you've got any questions, see Teresa. Also on Friday night, uh, the ladies will have their craft night at 5 p.m. and C-102. And we'll be out on the Salvation Army food truck on Friday night. If you've got any questions about that, see Mike Rogers if you're interested in helping with that. And, uh, and that'll be on Friday night. And then next Sunday morning, we'll be uh, celebrating communion. And uh, so make a special effort to be here with your family. At this time, I invite you to stand and pass the peace of Christ. Thank you for allowing me. Our invitation to worship this morning, I'd have you uh, notice inside your bulletin the uh, listing of our Perry County mission team. We leave on Thursday. Uh, we'll be serving in Perry County Thursday through uh, Sunday, and uh, we've listed our team. One thing I'd have you notice about the team is the, the cross-generational nature of the team. This is a family mission trip. Uh, we have um, from, I guess, nearly a first grader uh, through not a first grader <laughs> through maybe uh, prime timer individuals uh, and that's great when we dreamed up these trips uh, we wanted th this to be cross-generational in nature and that's the way it's developed and uh, we're going to have uh, activities and ministry projects for all age groups uh, and I'd invite you as part of our uh, invitation to worship to uh, pray for us as we minister down in Paris Perry County and, and uh, uh, Marion in particular and Turner Elementary School uh, and building a couple of handicap ramps and uh, uh, pray for us but also pray for the individuals we'll, we'll be partnering with. There's great needs down there. Pray for some individuals. Uh, pray for the uh, children we'll be uh, ministering to uh, and I'd invite you to do that this morning but also uh, next week as we're, we're serving in Perry County. Thank you for the support you give to missions. Please pray with me. 
Eternal God, stir our minds and stimulate our hearts as we celebrate this 4th of July weekend with a sense of patriotism, a devotion to democracy, and the responsibility to keep a government of the people, by the people, and for the people truly alive in our world. We resolve to dedicate ourselves to ushering in an era when good will and shall live in the hearts of a free people, when justice shall be the light to guide our, their feet, and when peace shall be the goal of humankind. We pray to God of thy holy name and the good of all mankind. Amen. Let us now sing together our hymn of praise, hymn number 51, Creator God Creating Still. Please stand as we sing together. service, we come to a time that we call Be Still and Know, in which we ask you to do exactly that, to be still, to take a moment of quiet, a moment of rest. I know that this is a weekend in which we have a lot of festivities, fireworks, cookouts, family time, passport trips, all kinds of things going on, and it can be wonderful and amazing, but also a bit exhausting. Maybe you're thinking about the things that you have done and the wonderful memories that they are. Or maybe you're thinking about the things you have coming up that maybe didn't get done over this holiday weekend. But in this time, in this place, we ask you to be still and to focus on worship, on God, on opening yourself to feel the movement of the Spirit. So let us now take a moment to be still. Creator God, Redeemer God, Sustainer God, we thank you for this chance to gather in worship today to praise your name, to lift our voices and our hearts together in worship of you. As we inherit this wonderful church, this amazing, rich tradition, help us to continue to be your church 
for each other and for this community. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good morning. Our scripture lesson this morning is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 4, verses 16 through 30. He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue, as was his custom, and he stood up to read. The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoner and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him, and he began to say to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. Isn't this Joseph's son, they asked? Jesus said to them, Surely you will quote this proverb to me. Physician, heal yourself. Do here in your home town what we have heard that you did in Capernaum. I tell you the truth, he continued. No prophet is accepted in his house, in his hometown. I assure you that there were many widows in Israel when Elijah's time, when the sky was shut for three and a half years and there was a severe famine throughout the land. Yet Elisha was not sent to any of them, but to a widow in Zephyrath, in a region of Sidon. And there were many in Israel with leprosy in the time of Elisha the prophet. Yet not one of them was clean, only Naaman the Syrian. All the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. They got up and drove him out of the town and took him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built in order to throw him down the cliff. But he walked right through the crowd and went on his way. May God bless the reading of his word. At this time, our pre-K and kindergartners are invited to exit for children's worship as we sing together our hymn of calling, Rise Up, O Church of God. You can find the words printed in your worship order. Please stand as we sing together. Please be seated. The alien who resides with you shall be to you as the citizen among you. You shall love the alien as yourself, for you were aliens in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Leviticus 19.34 The Internationals Team East is one of three teams that make up the Internationals cluster of CBF Global Missions. The core of the team is comprised of five couples who are based in the U.S. and minister to one or more ethnic groups. Their focus is to network and partner with Christians and churches 
who share this burden and vision to reach international peoples that God has brought to our neighborhoods. International's Team East members are part of the International's mission community, which enables collaboration, discussion, networking, and mission engagement with Christians and churches around the world. They engage in several networks through the mission communities, immigrant network, anti-trafficking network, Karen ministry network, Persian Network, Slavic Network, Islam Network, Latino Network, International Student Network, and Refugee Network. Many internationals have the opportunity to hear about Jesus while they are in their host countries. Ask God for open hearts and minds to a moving of the Holy Spirit towards the truth of Jesus Christ. Ask God to give field personnel wisdom and insight as they share their faith with their international friends. Please join me in silent prayer for mission. Amen. Thank you for that beautiful song, Taylor. Appreciate that. 
and good morning to you. I'm glad you're here today. We had a wonderful trip at Passport Camp, and many of you in Sunday school got to hear a report uh, about that trip, and we appreciate your prayers. If you didn't get to go, thank you for your prayers and support for our youth. We had 36 youth attend and several chaperones, and it was a really great time of bonding together, of learning about Christ together and having the opportunity to exercise the gifts of our young people and for me personally just a wonderful opportunity to be closer to them and we will have a fuller report by our youth on, on the 26th of this month uh, as they share some of their experiences uh, that they had at camp and some excitement uh, that they built preparing for the fall and the programming we'll also have baptism that day so we're looking forward to the 26th and a wonderful day of worship and it is a great day for us to worship throughout this weekend. What many of us have been celebrating, as uh, was mentioned earlier, as we celebrate the founding of the birthday of our country on the Independence Day, July 4th. And uh, I'm especially proud to live in a country where for the first time in the history of the world, we were guaranteed religious freedom uh, in our founding documents, in, uh, in our Constitution, the Bill of Rights. And so it's a privilege to worship and exercise that freedom today. And thank you for being here. And lastly, I just wanted to say for us as we pray for the work of our church that uh, the list that's in our bulletin of the folks who are going to Perry County uh, at the end of this week, I hope that you will pray for them and the people of Perry County. We have had a long partnership of missions with Perry County through Sowing Seeds of Hope. And uh, that is one of the 20 poorest counties in the United States. And I'm proud that we go there and have a consistent ministry of uh, friendship and relationship there. So pray for that group as they go and uh, Glenn as he leads uh, the trip. And uh, hopefully you'll be a little better off by the end of this week, getting that sling off and, uh, and all that good stuff. Well, we're in the midst of a series of sermons I've been preaching, sprinkling them throughout the summer on the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Today we're going to look at the Gospel of Luke, as you heard. And I'm doing this in honor of one of the great preachers of our time, Fred Craddock, who passed away this last spring. I heard him do lectures on these uh, Gospels back uh, many years ago when I was in seminary, and I based my sermons on the notes that I took in part from, from that time. And I remember he imagined a crossroads, and at each of the corners of the crossroads was a church, each church representing the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Today, as we look at the church of Luke, we'll notice that the biggest building in that complex is the Fellowship Hall. And as we draw closer to Luke's church, we will hear music blaring. We'll see banquet tables set up. There'll be a big open door for everybody to come in. And above that door will be a sign that says, y'all come. I know you think that's strange, but actually when I was in Israel, I remember seeing a plate that said, shalom y'all. So maybe there was a y'all come. <laughs> this is a y'all come church that Luke has. And the dream of this church is that everyone, all of the human family, would one day gather around this big banquet table. The gospel of Jesus Christ is founded and based primarily on the preaching of His death for us on the cross, for the salvation of our sins, and His resurrection from the grave. But it includes more than that. It includes also His words, His ministry, the way He treated people, His actions, and His life. And we have evidence of the importance of that to the early church by the fact that these four Gospels exist that include not only the stories of the death and resurrection, but also of His ministry in His life. So it's important, I think, that we look at these Gospels and think about how they preached Jesus. And the Gospels are not just text or words that preachers or Sunday school teachers or people can take and say, let me get a lesson out of them. Uh, Fred Craddock would say, it's not like dough and we just sort of mix it up and try to make biscuits out of it. It's more than that. It's not just material we use to take sermons. These Gospels are sermons. And so we should pay attention to how these first people, these first Christians preached Jesus. And one of the ways we've been doing that is looking at the opening shots of each of the Gospels. Matthew opens up telling us in his Gospel about Jesus as the great authoritative voice of the church. Jesus is the teacher of the church. His words and the way he taught us is the ethic for how we relate to people in the world, how we live. And when we want to know the authoritative answer on things, we go to Jesus. Mark presents Jesus as this big man who has entered into Satan's house. Jesus stands against the demonic and evil powers, the things that would hurt us in this world. And when we come to Luke, we come to meet a great preacher. Luke has a way with words. 
He presents us with literary uh, and other ways of presenting this message. It's an artist at work here. And he uses communication strategies that you all, we all still use today. There are travelogues in his stories in his two-volume work of Luke Acts. And they're travelogues that tell us interesting details about the journey that the people have been going on. There are farewell speeches. I remember seeing, and when I was studying in school, and I always loved history, I remember seeing a video of the speech of Douglas MacArthur, General MacArthur, as he stood before both houses of Congress. And in his farewell speech, you might remember, he said, old soldiers never die, they just fade away. And in Luke Acts, we have this preacher Luke presenting us with great farewell speeches as well. Stephen stands before a group of people in Jerusalem and says, You are the ones who received the law as ordained by angels, and yet you have not kept it. And they took him out of the city and stoned him to death for his final speech. Later, Paul will say, Let it be known that this salvation has been sent to the Gentiles, and they will listen to it. And there are courtroom scenes with great drama. One of the judges in the courtroom scene of Paul once said, Almost thou persuadest me, a judge, to become a Christian. And there are radical statements that Luke will have as you're reading his gospel that are just inserted and left there for us to deal with, to listen to, and consider. Like, God is kind to the ungrateful and to the selfish. And it just sits there for us. And there are refrains like we would hear maybe in the black church of preaching where it goes over and over and over again. There is Jesus coming for the first time looking over Jerusalem and weeping over that city and saying, if you only knew because you don't know the things that make for peace. And as he hangs on the tree on the cross, he says, you don't know what you're doing. When they take Peter and crucify him upside down, Luke tells us that they did that out of ignorance. They did not know who they had in their midst. And later, Paul is preaching at Mars Hill in Athens, Greece, among the great philosophers. And he says to them, there has been this time of ignorance. And so all of your transgressions have been overlooked, but no longer now there is a new situation, and this God I proclaim to you has been raised from the dead. His name is Jesus Christ. And in his book, there are sharp contrasts. This is not a story of someone who preaches and says, and, 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 and. Like we're riding down a long stretch of interstate that's just flat country, and it's all the same for miles and miles and miles. It's very interesting. Luke sets these contrasts before us. Old Simeon in the temple holding a six-week-old baby. And old Elizabeth, who has a child on the way, who will be John the Baptist, representing the old covenant, the prophets and the traditions. And there she gets a visit from young Elizabeth. I mean, young Mary, who is pregnant with the baby Jesus, representing the new thing that God will be doing. There are angels and their shepherds together in the fields, in chapter 7 of Luke, there are women who make their living on the streets. And in chapter 8, there are women who are financial benefactors of the ministry of Jesus Christ. In Luke 18, there is a woman, a widow, who complains and pleads loudly and longly to a judge till she finally gets justice. And in that same chapter, there are two people who go to the sanctuary to pray, and it is the guy in the back, the humble, silent sinner, who prays a simple prayer that God hears. Lots of people in Luke. And it's very interesting. It's not just a bunch of ideas going forth unto victory into this contemporary age in the present time of the society in which we live in this modern days of our present situation. It's pretty boring, right? That's not the way Luke does it. We need names. And we want addresses. We want details, personal, from the heart, information. And we get them. There are five emperors mentioned, three governors. There are three uh, emperor, three kings. There's Susanna and Joanna and... The parents, I know the names of the parents of John the Baptist, old Elizabeth, and his daddy was Zechariah, the priest. It's nice to get that kind of information, isn't it? 
I know the name of the army captain who saved the life of Paul in Jerusalem when they threatened to kill him. And he took him and kept him safely in the barracks there in Jerusalem. Claudius Lysias. I know the name of Governor Felix's wife, Drusilla, who later died in Pompeii when Mount Vesuvius erupted. We know that Herod Agrippa's wife was Bernice. She was also his sister, but I'm not going to go into that this morning. We know the name of the soldier who accompanied Paul in his journey to Rome, Julius. Luke knows how to preach, and he knows how not to get bogged down when he does it. He tells us the story of the prodigal son, the guy who's been away from his daddy, this young boy, and he's finally ready to come back home, and he rehearses his speech. As he gets ready, he sees the farmhouse and he sees his daddy on the porch and he rehearses his speech, but his dad jumps off the porch and runs to his son and the boy starts his speech and the dad says, all of a sudden there's a fatted calf and there's music and there's a party and, and the boy starts, there's none of this, I forgive you, you forgive me. It's just, oh, shut up, let's have a party. My son who was lost is now found again. Some people, you know, when they... You go to them and you ask them and they say, well, I forgive you. Their forgiveness is so full of spiritual and arrogance that you're just grinding your teeth the whole time. They forgive you for whatever you've done. Luke says, just start the party. And that's what he does. There was a peddler in the hills of North Carolina many years ago named Mr. Wing. And he was a, a guy that would walk around the hills and he'd say... Thread, cloth, needles. Anybody need thread, cloth, needles? No, we don't need any. Thank you, thank you. And one day he saw a little boy and he noticed the ragged clothes that he had. And with his tailor's eyes, he measured him. And so when he went back home, he made a coat, a yellow coat for this little boy. And a month later, he came back on his rounds again. Threads, cloth, needles. Anybody, anybody need threads, cloth, needles? And he sat down beside the little boy and put his pack down and he said, he said, you know, this, this pack is very heavy. And, and you know, the, he took this coat out and he said, you know, I, I made this coat. This is where he starts, starts lying. And he said, I made this coat for my grandson who lives in another state, but I forgot how fast kids can grow up and it's just not going to fit him anymore. I wonder if you could do me a favor because this pack is so heavy. Would you mind trying this coat on? And of course it fits perfectly. And he says to the boy, he said, you know, you could really help me out. He said, how could I do that? And he said, would you wear that coat? And he said, well, if it'll help you out. And he took the coat. And that night, the little boy slept in the coat. Mr. Wing knew how to give a gift, didn't he? And Luke is sensitive to the situation of the people of that time. He's sensitive to your life, too. You know, there is a language that we use to communicate. And there's like cookbook language where you just sort of have a list of stuff and it's information that we've got to have. So you need two tablespoons of molasses and four teaspoons of red pepper. And you need all this stuff to make barbecue sauce, which I like to make a lot. But then there's also the language of power, language of poetry. Hope is the thing with feathers that perches in the soul. I wandered lonely as a cloud Two roads diverged in the wood, for the cage bird sings of freedom. He ain't heavy. He's my brother. <laughs> Luke does both. He starts one chapter this way. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, Herod, Tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip, and you think, well, thank you. That's good information. Thank you. Thank you, Luke. Appreciate all that. And then all of a sudden, boom, the word of God came to John in the wilderness. Wow. It's fascinating, this preacher Luke and how he presents the story. They disbelieved for joy. Didn't our hearts burn within us when he opened up the word of God? He was made known to us in the breaking of the bread. When you read Luke... You're in the hands of a very skilled preacher. But now to what I really wanted to say. <laughs> Jesus stands in his hometown, in that synagogue of Nazareth one day, and he reads from Isaiah 61. And then he says, as he looks at the faces of the people in that congregation, you didn't get it, did you? And they're all sitting back, and it's like the days of Ezekiel, when Ezekiel preached his heart out, 
And they all said, boy, I love hearing Ezekiel preach. He is so eloquent. I love to hear him. Don't you? Yeah, I do. You're going to go back next week? Yeah, I'll go back next week. Okay, I'll see you there next week. And they never did a thing. And here they are as Jesus presents that message in his own hometown. And they say, isn't this Joseph's boy? You know, I love that passage. I've always liked that passage. You like it? Yeah, I like it too. And Jesus says, you didn't get it. This is not a dream for the future. This is an assignment for today. This binding up of broken hearts, healing of those who are sick, proclaiming release for those who are captive, hearing good news, giving that to the poor. This is an assignment. This is not a dream for tomorrow. This is what you are supposed to be doing today. And they said, isn't he such a good speaker? We love Jesus. And then he said, you're probably going to say to me, do these kind of miracles here like you did in Capernaum. But I say to you, you remember Elijah and that famine that lasted three and a half years. There were a lot of widows who were hungry and starving during that day. But the first one who got help was a widow who lived in Sidon. She was a Lebanite. Or Elisha. Elisha, in the days when leprosy was rampant, the first person that he healed was a Syrian army officer. And they said, I hate his preaching. <laughs> I don't like this Jesus. And they took him out to the cliff to kill him. Luke identifies Jesus with Elijah and Elisha and with Jonah. It's not just the sign of Jonah that we get from the other Gospels. You know, three days in the belly of the well and then out alive. Jesus, three days in the belly of the earth and the tomb and then alive. No, no, no. This is more than that. This is Jonah who went to Joppa to get away from the good news preaching to non-Jews. And so that's an important story in Luke because later on, Simon Peter bar Jonah also goes to Joppa and refuses to preach to the Gentiles until God shows him up at Caesarea. It's the same story, isn't it? Some people in Nazareth didn't want to hear that from their own Bibles, but they needed to hear it. And my question for you is, what do you need to hear from Jesus today? Jesus reads the condition of his times, and he reads the condition of Israel and he preaches. That's what a prophet does. Prophets are not people just predicting the future. Oh, what's going to happen down the road? What's going to happen when? Prophets are people who have the ability to reach down into the tradition of our own faith and bring it back, bring us the heart of it, and bring it back and present it to us in the condition of our lives at that time. That's why we need to teach the Old Testament and the New Testament. We're going to hear a lot more about that in the fall. If you don't, you're going to have a preacher that will stand before you and preach his or her own opinions. And they'll have balloons on the ceiling and lights flashing and they'll have these really sweet quips and somebody will say, we got a good one. <laughs> but there's no connection to anything. You're not connected to your own tradition. You're not connected to the words of Holy Scripture. A prophet draws it from the tradition, from our faith, and lays it back out there so we can see it. Somebody said any Christian that can't remember any further back than his or her own birth is an orphan. You need to know who Abraham and Sarah are, Isaac and Rebecca, Jacob, Rachel, Moses, Miriam, Andrew, Peter, James, John. Jesus takes it from their own Bibles and he lays it back out there for them and says, this is alive and real and fulfilled for you today. He lays out this grand vision. It's always been there. You're supposed to exist for the all nations. You're supposed to be a welcome house for every person. You're supposed to be a priest to minister to your neighbor in the world. But it's easy to avoid hard assignments, isn't it? It's hard to avoid, it's easy to avoid things that call us to be challenged at our core. It's easy to avoid things that go against our own prejudices. 
and our own sinful nature. It's easy to avoid the call of God to do something now and not put it off. Because there's 66 books in the Bible. There's a lot of other passages that we could go read if we wanted to. Jesus reaches right down in there into their own tradition of faith and brings out the vision and lays it for them to see it again through His eyes. But now I know some people cherish their vision so much that it becomes a buffer so they actually don't do anything. And they'll say, you know, when the Messiah comes. You know, when the time is right. I've really got a lot going on in my life right now. But when things settle down, and I know that God would have me do something, but I'm going to sit here and wait for the Spirit to move me. That's what I'm waiting for, when the Messiah comes. Craddock would say, some people love the second coming more than they do the first coming of Jesus. The first job the Messiah has to do is to get people to quit looking for the Messiah. Today, this has been fulfilled. And you're hearing. It's not a matter of going back to the good old days. This, this is the good old day. This is the day the Lord has made. We're supposed to rejoice and be glad in it. And to take the assignment of God seriously today. Well, we want to go back to the Bible. <laughs> this is the Bible. What is it you and I need to hear from Jesus today? And what is the response that Jesus is longing to hear from you today? There is hard resistance to Jesus. Take him out to the cliff. Throw rocks at him. Throw him off the cliff. But there's also soft resistance. Well, I agree with you. I mean, personally, I agree with you. But I don't think our church is ready just yet. You know, I, we're on the, we got this committee. And I personally agree with you. But the committee, we're just not ready yet. I know God expects me to reach out to others and to pray and to serve. I know that he does, and I plan to do that someday, but I have a lot going on right now. When things settle down just a little bit, there's hard resistance, but there's also soft resistance. The people who took Jesus out of that synagogue that day were his relatives, his friends, schoolmates. It'd be a lot easier if it was a truck that pulled up and a bunch of ugly guys got out, and that those are the ones providing the resistance. But what the pain of the whole thing is, it's people that sit beside us in church on Sunday. That's part of our own families, part of our friends at school. And they're the ones. Jesus reached into our own tradition of faith and brought it out alive, the heart of it again, and laid it before them as a gift of His love for people that He cared about. At Passport this week. There was a time when we gathered at night with just our church group, and every church group did that. And they asked us these little questions that we were supposed to do for our devotional time. And we're tired, it's late, and there's snacks sitting down front. But one of the questions really, really stood out to me. And it was for our youth to answer, who at your church is an inspiration to your faith? You ought to ask them. Ask our young people. Who in the church is an inspiration to their faith? This dream of Luke's church is that the doors would be flung open wide and every person in the human family would be welcomed at the banquet table. But somebody's got to open the doors. Somebody's got to turn on the lights. Somebody has to set the table. Somebody has to stand in the parking lot and welcome people in. Somebody has to make the food. Somebody's got to play the music, right? I'm asking us to open our hearts to the call of the Great Commission to invite those who have no church home like we have a church home. Be somebody who says, I got a lot of time restraints on me, ball games and business and work and relaxation and TV shows and family commitments, but I will put Christ first in my priority list, and I will offer this humble gift that lies within me to Him. Be somebody who decides that today is the time to get real about growing in my discipleship. Make a stand and say, today 
it begins with me. Why not? Why not repent today and let go of the sins that hamper and pull you down in your life and turn in trust to the faithful freedom and forgiveness of Jesus Christ? Why not today say, I want the light of Jesus to shine through me so that people will see the God that exists in this world? Today, take the step to go ahead and bravely come forward and say, I want to trust Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Today, offer the forgiveness that you've been holding back for someone close to you. And today, receive the forgiveness that you need to hear and accept fully. Today, start the revolution of Jesus. Today, take that step where you do something in faith so that a young person in your own church looks at you and says, there is my inspiration. God still calls us, wants to use us, wants us to go and seek and love and give and make a difference, wants us to be people who follow His Son, so what is it you and I need to hear from Jesus today? And what are we waiting for? Let me remind you that the first quotation, the first word of the first quote that Jesus ever spoke was from a sermon. And according to Luke, that word was today. Amen. Hello, I'm Mike Oliver. I'm the senior pastor here at Trinity Baptist Church. I'd like to thank you for joining us for worship through our church website. And also, I'd like to invite you to come and visit us. This is a great church. We have friendly people here. We value worship. We value community and global missions. And there are programs for children all the way to senior adults. I think you'll like our church, and I hope you'll come and visit us and see for yourself in person. If you have questions about our church, like to know more, We'd love for you to contact us. There's information on our website. You can call us or email us or come by, and one of our staff members will be glad to talk with you. Welcome to Trinity, and God bless you and keep you.